Pixel Live. My name is Adam Pandlin, I'm the editor at Pixel, and we'd like to thank CCAM, or I'd like to thank CCAM for sponsoring this episode. CCAM do a range of housings and strobes, ports and accessories. Um, please head on over to ccam.com to check out what they do. Um, and my purpose of this um, Pixel Live episode really is to recount some of the details of um, a, 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 an event I attended um, which was run by Nikon UK um, and um, the event was really primarily the, it was the Nikon Professional Services of which I remember um, and they were launching the new Nikon Z9 um, camera to the sort of professional membership um, obviously in this case in the UK um, and these were events that used to occur annually, obviously with the advent of the pandemic. That's not happened for a couple of years. This is the first one we've had for a couple of years. Um, it was a very interesting event. Um, it was really great to be able to, to meet and interact with, with other photographers um, and obviously to meet and interact with the Nikon team. Um, there's some, some, some very knowledgeable people. Um, and um, and also to get hands on with the Z9, you know the Z9 is 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 undoubtedly a, you know an amazing camera and it's capable of, of of producing amazing imagery. And and for those that aren't familiar, obviously it also really marks Nikon's first pro professional um, mirrorless camera. Um, and so it, you know it's quite a big reputation builder for Nikon as well. You know if they've got to get this one right because this is the one that you're going to see on the. Um, Pro's hands on the on the sidelines of football pitches, um, on the sidelines of sports events um, at the Olympics, um, in the hands of journalists um, on the news, all that kind of stuff. You know, this is the camera that certainly is going to going to be very visible for Nikon, and it's a very important part of what Nikon do. I think Nikon's heritage um, certainly builds on this idea of of, of top level pro cameras. So, so with that in mind, I mean, the, the first impression really is that. The, the Z9 is a big camera. Um, you know, make no error about it. This is a pro camera, not the same house, same stable. I'm careful the word housing with underwater photographers, but the same stable as cameras like the D5 and the D6. Um, it's a big camera with a substantial side grip. Um, in terms of size, it's certainly bigger than, for example, the 850, but it's probably slightly smaller than the Z8. It's smaller than it's thinner than the Z6. Although by the time you add uh, a D6, by the time you add the um, adapter for the F to Z, if you convert it to F mount lenses, um, in actual fact, the depth, this depth's a bit moot because it obviously then increases the, the distance in front of the in front of the camera, in front of the flange. Um, so it's a big camera, and part of the reason for it being big, and I think Nikon really need to be congratulated about this, is it's got a hoofing great battery in it. And, and one of the tendencies that I think I've observed from other manufacturers with their sort of pro level or upper level bodies is they seem to have compromised on battery performance or battery size of mirrors cameras. And frequently, actually, even pre mirrorless, the, 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 their batteries tended to be less, have less duration. And, and Nikons, I think, have a fairly proud history of having good duration. I would argue that's true of most of Canons as well. So, um, but certainly, um, this continues that trend and it has a big big battery in it. And, you know, if you think about it, the moment you introduce an electronic viewfinder, which obviously mirrorless cameras have, it has a higher power drain than you would have with a uh, camera with a mirror that um, doesn't actually have an EVF. Um, so, so SLRs by definition need less power than, than mirrorless. And yet the tendency is for the batteries to get smaller and less powerful. And that seems to me to be counterintuitive. Um, proposal and, and I think Nikon would be congratulated they're bucking that trend um, with the Z9, the Z9 has a big battery. I mean in conversation with some of the people at the event who actually use the camera they say it has about half the duration of a D6. Now D6 duration is amazing um, you know you're talking easily a day's worth of shooting um, and so you know you, you, there's no they, 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 well, there's no I, I, I anticipate that there's plenty of power for for, for what we do underwater and I, by, when I say a day's worth of shooting that's been sort of full-time kind of journalistic type shooting where they're, where they're shooting tens of thousands of frames a day and for us in underwater doing three or four dives you know it, it, it shouldn't be an issue so I think I think that's a really good thing and um, obviously we don't have the opportunity of popping our housing open and sticking any battery in them every time it runs a bit low um, so so um, so battery duration is important and I think you know this camera certainly addresses that I think that's a that's a great um, a great plus to it and um, it's a, a 40 
five megapixel, it's a high resolution camera, and um, it has plenty of resolution. And Nikon have done clever things with the, the, way, the lens mounting. It has a wider, but also shallower mounting. So the shallower means that obviously the um, back of the lens can be mounted closer to the sensor. And I, and I believe it, of the, of the, between Sony, Canon and Nikon, it is the shallowest mounting. I think it's 16 mil, but, uh, but I might be, be incorrect on that. But I believe it's shallowest. Now the advantage of that is obviously that theoretically the light doesn't have to travel as far for its sensor. And, and there were some very impressive, um, very impressive, images that were shown during the, during the event and um, which showed how good the camera's edge sharpness is and I think certainly you know they they actually did compare it to 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 other brands and other models um, but uh, uh, you know I think there's no doubt that this idea of of edge sharpness will be a function of lens mount um, and that, I think that's that's a very cool thing and definitely is you know a clever bit of engineering on, on, and design on behalf of the Nikon engineers. It also is a substantially wider mount, um, and where that comes in, again, that's a clever idea. You know, if you've got a wider mount, you can produce lenses that are faster. It, quite simply, that you can accommodate bigger lens elements. So um, if fast lenses are in something that you want to design, um, obviously the more width you have to play with, the more light comes in and the faster the lens is. So, so you know, um, by, by increasing the size of the uh, of the actual flange, it allows you basically design lenses that work better than I like, which I mean, for the vast majority of, of photographers is, is, is quite a big bonus. So, so it's a clever bit of design. I'm um, obviously not unique to Z9, um, common to the, to the Z6, Z7, um, you know, and you know, I think it's, um, uh, but I think it is a, a, a definitely a positive thing. Um, <laughs> Of course, for us, underwater and um, fast lenses um, really don't have, well, fast wide angle, fast, fast macro lenses. Yeah, it could be creatively very interesting because, you know, we could create great depth of field effects, um, you know, really blurring out backgrounds, so on and so forth. Um, with um, wide angle, obviously, we bump into all the problems then of um, corner performance and depth of field. It's a full front camera, so relatively shallow depth of field. So it has all those potential optical problems that, that they all have. Um, the, 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 the lens mount doesn't affect that. So, so possibly for wide angle use, um, you know, the idea that we can use faster lenses something is, is probably less of a, uh, an exciting thing for underwater photographers. Um, it has um, a flash six speed of 200th, um, which I would say is, I mean, a lot of strobes and a lot of um, the um, cam the strobe firing mechanisms of the strobe um, circuitry now um, has the option of high speed sync. Um, I would say that a 200th is probably not brilliant for underwater use. Um, certainly, obviously, the Sony Sony um, A1 offers much faster shutter speeds, like up to a 400th, um, depending on what mode it's used in. I think, I think that may be an APS-C mode, but in a way, it's certainly faster. Um, so, so not the fastest shutter speed in the um, flash sync speed in the world, which I think is probably a bit of a downside for underwater photography. And um, certainly, I think I, if I was using this camera under, I'd want to be pairing it with a strobe that is is high speed sync compatible. Um, I think that would be be an important consideration and one that you certainly would, you know, if you're looking at buying into a system with this, I think probably look at both circuitry and strobes that can cope with with high speed sync. So you have those options available to you if you need them. Um, so two hundred, I think, is is a slightly disappointing um, shutter speed. The camera is phenomenally fast. You know, the Z9, it, it, it's, it's, it will shoot, I think, up to 20 frames a second in RAW. And again, I, I, forgive me if that's just you know, right. It's not as aesthetic. I'm terribly, terribly interested in because there's no way my underwater strobes are going to keep up. And, and to be honest, even shooting in ambient light, it's, it's, it's faster. I think, I think actually, I think, in, yeah, I think it's 20 frames per second in RAW, and I think it'll do 120 frames per second in JPEG. You know, crazy fast. It is, it is a phenomenally fast camera. But those are not statistics. They are. I mean, if I'm a press photographer trying to catch at the moment, absolutely. But given that the majority of underwater photography is undertaken with um, strobes, and they're not going to keep up at those speeds. So, so I'm not sure it's a major um, characteristic. But it's there if you want it. Um, and you know, and I think there's there's a lot to be said for, for having stuff that, that's available. But um, but I'm not I'm not convinced that it would sway me one way or another. Um, it has um, the what Nikon claim is the 
world's best autofocus. And, and I think possibly one of the highlights of being able to get hands on with this camera was that I was able to do some, some very perfunctory and very brief testing. I, I can't claim this is definitive. So please, you know, um, don't, don't crucify me for, 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 for my comments. And um, so I tend to shoot my um, Nikon cameras most of the time, not all the time, in, in, in continuous autofocus, so AFC for those who are familiar with the terminology, um, in, in Nick Power Speak, I think it's Nick Servo. Um, and then I use a 3D focus mode. And the idea behind 3D focus mode is I pick a spot, I would then hold that spot by using back button focus, and then the camera will track that spot that around the frame. So, so wherever I've put that point, it tracks it around the frame. Now, 3D is pretty clever in that it uses, it doesn't only rely on focus data, it also uses things like contrast and color data. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's an algorithmic based autofocus. And, and in my experience, it's very, very, very accurate. Um, certainly on, on D850, D500, I use a lot. It's amazingly accurate um, and, and very, very rarely gets it wrong, actually. You know, I have to say it's, 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 it's a phenomenal, um, phenomenally accurate um, focus mode. So I set the Z9 into that into that focus mode um, and I was very fortunate that at the event they also had the new Z105 S2.8 macro um, lens, obviously the, the new version of, 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 here we are, this one here, the new version of, of this one. Um, so, um, and, um, so I set it up exactly as I would normally, um, obviously get my, got my exposure setting set up and started shooting. And, the the first point is that I think the camera feels wonderful, so it felt good. Obviously, but we put in the housing that would change. Um, but um, I noticed that the behaviour on the way the camera focuses is basically what it would do is would rack the focus the whole way out and then rack in to achieve focus. Now, this could be a setting. I'm not going to claim that um, that. It's, it isn't, but certainly as a result, it was relatively slow to focus. I was shooting a macro subject, as it happens, it was a coffee, sa coffee sachet, which had color separation deliberately. It was bright green on a, on a brown background. So, you know, I, but it wasn't one fully lit, so relatively dark. And it was accurate. It achieved all the focus. Every time, every time when it achieved focus, it was super accurate, no problem at all. Um, you know, it was right on the spot wherever, wherever it was. And it tracked around the frame very, very well. I will come back to that in a minute. Um, but but it, it it wasn't as fast, and I literally had the, the, the my my D850 with with its with the the 105 on it, and I would actually say that given the behaviour that the Z9 had, and as I say, maybe a setting issue, this is faster. It's it, they're equally accurate. I wouldn't say that the 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 Z with the Z macro is any more accurate than the D850 with the the, the older macro, the F map macro, uh, 105 macro. Um, they're pretty much the same, um, but I would say that the older one, the SLR, is definitely faster to focus. Now, again, to stress, um, because I'm aware it's contentious, um, I would say that that will, there may be a setting within the nine menus that, that I'm not aware of that may allow it to go straight to the autofocus point. Um, but the, the, the camera that I used was racking all the way out and then zooming in, whereas with my D850, it's, it goes straight to the focus point. Um, so, First point, um, you know, I, I think around on that, I would say equal accuracy, um, Z9 is slower. Um, I then obviously mounted the FTZ adapter, the FTZ2, so the new one, to, with the, um, again, with my 105. Um, and I was actually very disappointed with its performance. Um, it was hunting. Um, it was it was struggling to achieve focus. As I say that it was in a room that was relatively dark. Um, I did have color. You know, again, the modes hadn't changed. It was all 3D autofocus. But certainly I found that the focusing was significantly worse than it was with the new Z macro or the, the, the old, as, as the, the old 105 works on DA50. Significantly worse. Um, it it rem it reminded me of kind of, I don't know, <laughs> D7000, D800 sort of autofocus. So a couple of generations, a few generations of auto, previous autofocus. So I think the takeaway from this is that if you're going to use, if you're going to buy into the Z system, 
and really you want to be considering buying into the lenses system as well rather than just the the cameras and then using your existing bodies with the adapter um, i i don't know whether the separation of the the back of the lens and the sensor by obviously now that we when we introduce the the adapter, the flange, that advantage of flange distance I mentioned earlier goes away because the distance is the same as it is on your F-mount lens. That's what the adapter does. Um, and whether that then affects the way that the, the, cam the, 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 the lens, the, the, the camera focuses, I'm not sure. Um, I can't honestly say, but I was thought that the, for macro anyway, the um, focusing performance of the Z9 with the FTZ2 adapter and the legacy 105 um, micro was quite inferior to that of the um, of the SLRs, a um, long way inferior. So to summarize um, my experience with the 105 um, the Z9 with one with Z macro, um, equal in accuracy but slower. Um, and with the FTZ2 and the 105 F-mount lens um, was, well, I would say was significantly worse. So um, I think, I think um, it, this should be kind of balanced against the fact that I was, I'm was i used to shooting with the F50 D500, which in my experience have the best order focus that there is. Um, it's almost, it's almost um, cheating. So, so um, you know, I am comparing, I'm not comparing average autofocus with, I'm comparing very good autofocus. So, yeah, okay. So um, the next test I did was I mounted up my um, uh, H15, Nikon H15, um, it's a lovely lens, um, and um, H15 fisheye. Um, and um, again, mounted this up, obviously using FTZ adapter because there's no other choice. Um, and Actually, you know, again, I mean, unsurprisingly, autofocus on it was fine. I, I didn't expect any issues with autofocus with a fisheye lens. And it would be strange if there was. It was reasonably fast. It seemed accurate enough. What I really liked about it, what I did notice was, again, with 3D autofocus, it tracked right to the edge of the frame. So, so literally, you know, until it, until you couldn't basically, which is, which is definitely, you know, the, the, the advantage of having on chip. Um, autofocus is that you can extend the autofocus area and this is why you get these crazy number of autofocus points which which really aren't terribly relevant anymore um, but um, but the, obviously the by extending the focus um, points right to the edge of the of the and it's definitely I, what I was doing is I was panning and as I was panning you could literally follow that tracking point going all the way from side to side of the frame and um, and that, that, I mean, I think that probably is a good thing. I'm not sure compositionally, you know, most of the time you, you don't want your subjects um, to be right on the edge of a frame, but I mean, I guess there may, there may be times when that's useful. Certainly, certainly it might allow, give you time to catch up if you're, if you are busy panning while you're shooting something fast moving. Um, and, and, and I think it would do that very well. Um, I didn't test the, um, I focus modes on it and um, I I guess I wanted to go with a mode that I know and, and I know how it works and I'm very familiar with 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 the 3d autofocus mode and um, there is some debate as to whether the I focus mode there's an animal there's, sorry there's a human I focus mode and also an animal I focus mode and um, and there's some debate as to how accurate the animal I focus mode will be with fish eyes and um, the short answer is I don't, fish that's as in fish's eyes rather than fish eye lenses and um, and and I, and I think um, there's some debate as to how, what, how that will work. Um, I think time will tell. Um, it certainly, certainly the 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 eye focus seems to be very much a feature that's being incorporated on most mirrorless cameras now. Um, and you know, I think you know, well, it, it, it's there. Um, how accurate it may be, it may be very accurate. I don't know. Um, certainly, I must must confess that with three D autofocus, I've typically found that. If I manage to get the focus spot on the eye, um, the the camera does a pretty good track, pretty good job of tracking the eye anyway. Um, but I guess in situations and maybe backwater could be an example of this way, where, where you've got really low contrast situations. You know, you've got a translucent subject in the darkness um, and poorly lit, and you're moving because you're busy trying to maintain neutral buoyancy over a thousand meters of seawater. And um, you know, I, I can see that in those sort of circumstances, every every trick will help and it may be that some kind of eye focus might work quite well. It needs more experimentation and I'm sure um, there will be people out there that will shoot the, uh, the eye focus modes on Z9 and, and other mirrorless cameras um, and we'll be able to report back on that which I think is um, which will be a useful exercise. Um, so um, 
Other features, obviously the EVF. Um, I, I'm <laughs> I'm going to admit I'm, I'm not a huge fan of EVFs. I, I don't, I prefer an optical viewfinder. That may just be because I'm not what I'm used to. It probably is that's because I'm what, what, what I'm used to. Um, I, and, and, and others did point this out, I actually found that the, the EVF, obviously you can review images in the EVF, and I don't find, and it may be in my eyesight as well, I don't find that the actual image area is big enough for me to review critical focus. Now I could zoom in, um, um, but that would involve doing something. I can evaluate critical focus on an LCD without zooming in. Um, so, so it's rare that I need to zoom in to find out where the stuff's in focus, but I couldn't do it with an EVF. Now, again, you know, this is a very personal observation, not something that I can, I can definitively say. The EVF seemed sharp, efficient. Um, I didn't really get a chance to see how it worked with high contrast scenes. You know, the classic when we're shooting underwater and we have a subject in front of us that's not lit and we've got a background that's lit. Can it cope with that range of contrast and um, certainly the, the guys from Nikon were unsure as to whether that would be the case I think would be a polite way of putting it so I think I think they um, were unwilling to commit to say that it would work in those in, with it with that degree of tonal range and um, you know it, otherwise it, well, it was it was fine you know it was it was okay um, and and I think you know this should be that what I've said there should definitely be um, listen to with the idea that if you like EVFs, you'll probably like the Z9's EVF, um, and, and I'm probably it's probably more to do with the fact that I'm used to using optical viewfinders and, and, and don't use EVFs very much that I'm probably making these comments. So, so uh, please take them with your with the appropriate um, caution. Um, so. Um, otherwise, um, I thought the, the as I said, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think it is an amazing camera. Um, oh, I meant to, meant to mention video. So video, I, I'm not a big video guy. Most of you will know this. Um, many of you will know this, but um, it, it has a pretty impressive um, video resume. Um, it will shoot 8K, record internally. Um, it has the option of shooting raw. Or, or it's coming. The option of shooting raw, I think, is coming. Um, it will shoot... 4K, 120 frames per second, again, internal recording. Um, so, you know, it's a very competent video camera. Um, they made the point, the Nikon guys made the point that, you know, they don't have a, a, a Nikon doesn't have an ecosystem of dedicated video cameras that it needs to protect, obviously dig at, at Canon. Um, and, and so they can incorporate as many features as they want into, into the, um, into the um, Z9 um, and, and without damaging their video camera market um, and that's certainly true I mean, I'm sure it's a very competent video camera and um, time will tell whether it does manage to um, get up there with the you know the classics kind of Canon C70s those kinds of things I don't know um, it's not my area of expertise and, and I'd be fascinated to, to, to hear more from people who are shooting video particularly underwater with them to find out you know what quite how they find them the pros and cons and um, in general I think that the the, the feeling was that the continuous auto focus was very good with video but again that was a subjective feeling primarily actually from the participants in the event rather than rather than Nikon themselves so, so as a final thought um uh, the um the, the questioning i i asked the question and i said you know is there going to be another um slr model is 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 there a d860 or a d7 or you know whatever the next is there going to be and, and the short answer is that they didn't know what they weren't saying and um, there was no definitive answer um, but they were, he they were very much um, suggesting that the future and uh, he did hedge this by saying it was his opinion rather than Nikon's opinion the future is mirrorless and, and Nikon are investing their energy and time in designing and refining mirrorless designs not in refining um, SLR designs. Now, Nikon has in the past made somewhat maverick decisions about you know, what it's going to do with camera ranges. It, it wouldn't be unique. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, they, they certainly, there was no particular, they didn't exclude the possibility, but they thought it was unlikely. I think that's the, probably the right way of describing it. So those of you that are considering a next camera purchase um, and are thinking, well, should I wait for the D860? I see no evidence 
um, from my experience and what they were saying that that's likely to happen. Uh, having said that, please don't take that to the bank. It's it's a guess as much as anything. Um, but in the position, I'm in the position where obviously I do get to possibly hear things and, and, and interact with people that, that may know stuff that's going on. Um, I, it also, and just to stress, as of tomorrow, you know, we could see um, the a D860 launch. So please be careful. I did notice today that in the news that they've announced that there are now plans between now and 2025, so what, three years, um, that there will be 50 Z mount lens models. Again, they haven't specified what they are. You know, I don't know whether a fish eye will be included in that. That's the obvious glaring problem with, with all mirrorless camera systems at the moment, really. Um, mirrorless full frame camera systems, sorry, um, is, is the lack of, of, of native fish eyes. Um, I think probably a native fish eye within the can, with the Nikon e ecosystem, or the Canon ecosystem for that matter, will be a bit of a game changer in terms of what we're trying to do with them underwater. Um, and that will make them much more accessible um, for underwater underwater use in general, um, so we'll see. Um, you know, you know, fifty lenses somewhere in that. Hopefully, there's there's space for for a good fish eye. Anyway, I hope it's been useful. I'm 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 I you know I I bring these things with my own bias, and, and I know I got called uh, what did I get called? I got called an SLR all time of the day, which I thought was quite flattering, really. Um, but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And, and if people have comments or suggestions about their experiences of, of mirrorless cameras, including the Z9s or the Z6s or Z7s, um, I, I, or any other mirrorless camera, obviously, please feel free to, to add it in the comments below this video. I, I welcome a debate on this. I think, I think we should be talking about this and trying to figure out what the best options going forward are. Um, and, and, you know, it's certainly something that I think we should, we should cultivate an, a, a lively debate on. Um, feel free to like the video. And as I mentioned before, thanks very much to CCAM um, for sponsoring this video. Um, certainly I know that um, many of the housing manufacturers are planning to, to, to or have already launched Z9 housings. Um, certainly Nauticam has, um, I think um, I feel like may of, and I certainly know that, that CCAM are planning to, I'm sure Aquatica and, um, and all the other major housing manufacturers, Subal, will will do the same soon as well. So, but thanks very much to CCAM for this episode. We really appreciate the support. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much and all the best. best.